Yaba area of Lagos is seen as the birthplace of tech startups in Nigeria as it has birthed many tech startups that have changed the face of many sectors in the country. Some have even likened it to Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, California in the United States of America. What is now known as Yabakon Valley lies on Herbert Macaulay Way in the Yaba area of Lagos, measuring about 11.8 kilometers. It houses Nigeria's first startup incubator and a host of other startups that have shaped Nigeria. Our intention was, was always how do we quickly accelerate the growth of that ecosystem? You know, how do we attract the right support and attention to the young people that started building great, you know, technology solutions? Uh, from from Lagos and from the rest of Nigeria, to be honest, you know, how do we how do we get them to uh, access the resources they need to grow? And and one of the ways we figured we needed to take was to create a cluster, create a location where these companies co locate. Partnership with um, the Lagos State Government, Technovision and Minmon, the ISP provider, they laid 27 kilometers of um, fiber optic cable around the Yaba Shomolu area, and then. Because of that, you know, access to unlimited internet, uncapped internet, people started to move in around there. With over $1.85 billion in investment raised since 2010, with 90% of that figure from foreign sources and millions of jobs created for the youths, experts believe more can be attracted. We have a policy environment that is not anti-innovation. Uh, I think number two is also to commit very strongly uh, to a pipeline, uh, I mean cap building capacity so that when you know more ants are needed, they will be available. And, and I think the third, which is probably the most critical, is to also, you know, beyond just policy and capacity building, is to celebrate and encourage innovation. There's justification for why we should see more clusters. I think Yaba has inspired this uh, to a large extent. After incubating tech startups that have affected various sectors of the economy and lives of Nigerians, Yaba Valley gained global recognition, including visits by CEOs of Facebook, Google and Twitter. With the federal government supporting tech hubs in other parts of the country, enthusiasts believe that other regions will also build an ecosystem that will thrive incubate great startups and ultimately be seen as key players in the global tech ecosystem. All right, thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back uh, to uh, Nigeria at 60 Diamond Air in uh, the Rough. Uh, Victor Matas' report there highlighting the impact that the youth have been making down the years uh, all the way up until uh, today, particularly in the area of information and communications uh, technology. Uh, IJ, uh, how fitting then that we should speak to the Minister of Youth Development and, and sports, of course, well. sports, right. uh, Mr. Sunday Dari, who joins us uh, from our Abuja studios. Uh, welcome, Mr. Dari. Thank you for joining us on this special day and happy Independence Anniversary. Thank you very much. Good evening. Let me launch straight into it and talk to you about or ask you about uh, youth development and the creative uh, unleashing of their potentials. Uh, how do you think we are fed in, in that respect? Uh, do you think we've done well? Well, I, I think we've done well, particularly when you look at uh, the level of the individual youth through uh, very personal initiative of our talented youths, but also in the last five or so years, we've seen the government moving under President Buhari to embrace the tech hubs. You just, we just saw a clip about Yabakon. Yabakon is our answer to Bangalore in India, is our answer to Silicon Valley in America, and apart from Kenya and South Africa, no other country in Africa has the number of tech hubs that we have across the country. And they have continued to increase the in number, and they're getting support from government. So I think we, we have done well so far. But of course, we need to deepen that process. We know that we live in an age where there's digital skills gap. About, apart from innovation, there are over 220 digital tools that can be created. We need to equip our, our youth with the digital skills they need to be able to play 
in the uh, present digital economy. There are still quite a number of uh, things we need to do. We need to ratchet up the number. We need to, incre we need to create and support more tech hubs. We need to turn many of our youths to tech techpreneurs by providing them the necessary capital and credit they need to be able to get their own startups up and running. What you've just said, what you just described would be the number one complaint of many of those youths, that even when they come up with uh, many of these uh, ideas and many of these uh, technologies, they don't receive, they don't get support. Uh, so maybe the next logical question would be, in what practical way is government uh, setting out to assist these ones? Uh, for example, those uh, in uh, the Yabakon uh, uh, Valley that we talked about. Well, let me, let me also try to expand it. Beyond those in, in the Yabakon, those that are developed the apps and so on, we have our youth also engaged in the creative industry in several aspects of uh, creating content, entertainment, and other key aspects, even in agriculture, smart agriculture. So when you look at the whole gamut of youth involvement, uh, it goes beyond just Yabakon. But let me respond to your question. It is true that they have encountered a number of challenges, particularly the cumbersome access to, to credit and finance. But also side by side with that is also the uptake. The uptake you expect from the private sector is not there. Because when you look at India and a couple of other countries, even China, once they are, you develop uh, these new tools, there's an uptake on the part of government, but also largely on the part of uh, venture capitalists and also private sector. So first, I think in a deliberate way, the government needs to have a deliberate policy that will create a pipeline or optic. As soon as these things are developed, the government will serve as a buffer between the, the youth and also the, uh, the private sector. The government on its part can also take up some of this. But remember, partnership with the private sector is now the in thing. Secondly, after one year of being minister, I have seen that there's a dirt of credit facilities the access to credit is not there for our youth. Some of them, before they get credit, the idea they have, the ideas they have, time will have overtaken them. So we know that just about two months ago, the president approved the establishment of the Nigerian Youth Investment Fund, NYIF, for the first time. That's a 75 billion naira fund to invest in the ideas, innovative ideas, enterprise, and skills of our youth. And every Nigerian youth who has an idea, who has an existing business or enterprise, will be able to apply for this fund. I can say that from Monday, the portal for application will open, and every Nigerian youth, whether in Yabakon or you're involved in smart agriculture or you have a brilliant idea, you just need to go through the application process, write your proposals, that will be reviewed, and you can draw directly from the fund. The beauty about the fund is that the fund is a ring-fence fund. That is, the fund there cannot be used for any other purpose than to invest in the ideas, innovative minds and skills of our youth. And we, we hope that this will endure. Mr. Derek, what is the creative plan for, for, our, for sports and our youth in the next decade? I mean, you've, we've looked at, at the beginning when we were talking about milestones, we talked about 1996 and what a year it was for us. But then, you know, we find that we, we sort of fall into tournaments and competitions and there's always that narrative around the preparation and um, we are not lacking creative youths. Is there a, a creative plan for us in the next 10 years for, for youths to key into outside Yabakon now? And uh, what would it be? What are you starting with? Absolutely. Um, I think sometime in June we did roll out a 10-year sports development plan. Mm -hmm. What we have had in the past is a departure from sports development. We just simply funded competitions. We wait for Olympics to come, we fund our participation in the Olympics. We wait for Commonwealth Games, All African Games, Sports Festival. But the real sports development itself did not uh, take center stage. So what we've done is to have a 10-year plan that will see us have a sports development that transcends just attending competitions. And what that does is it has at its core a sports industry policy. We have a draft of that already. We're trying to build a business model around our sports, to turn our sports into industry that will put value on our athletes, on our young ones. But also embedded within that is a talent hunt program 
that focuses on grassroots sports where the talented youth are vested at an early age. They are put through a program to our federations and supported to hone their skills. We believe that if private fund comes into sports development in terms of infrastructure, investment, incentive, driven by the sports industry policy, which we hope to deliver before the end of this year, we're going to see a huge transformation. When you go to Jamaica, you go to the UK, you go to Brazil, Canada, America, sports is business, and you see the entire value chain. You don't have to be a sportsman or woman to benefit. Merchandise, you can benefit from there. So we intend to also open up that entire value chain for our youth. Sports in this country, if it's well-developed and turned into sports, into business, can generate millions of employment for our youth, can be a new path of revenue generation for government, can also contribute about 2% to GDP. I think we're on that path, and I think the Federal Executive Council under President Mahmoud Buhari about two months ago reclassified sports away from recreation and classified sports as business. The MBS only sees as recreation, but now sports is business. And I think for us, that is the trigger that we need. All right, then. Uh, Honorable Minister, let me, let me then take it from where you've said. I mean, the whole issue of sports being a business and how we need to create uh, the value chain. Is there a link between that, or are you creating a link between that, uh, shall we say, and what is going on in other sectors so that you're not operating in a silo in youth development in particular, because in youth development, all these various other sectors tend to have impact. Uh, COVID-19, for example, if we take a look at COVID-19 and how it has impacted on youth development and sports in particular, uh, is there a link, would you say? Are you linking all these sectors and how much collaboration is there between you uh, and your colleagues in, in other uh, in charge of other sectors which may impact sports yeah. and youth development. Absolutely. Uh, a terrific question. Yes, there's a link. And actually, there are several links, several linkages. Uh, you talked about sports and the impact uh, COVID-19 has had on sports. But also, that gave us the opportunity as a country to start to look inwards towards developing esports. Esports is a global game about $1.4 billion and is still expanding. We have keyed in into esports across the country and COVID-19 actually helped us and pushed us in that direction. But also you recall, we've been working with the NESG in the last three years, but especially in the last one year, we've collaborated with the NESG to be able to work on a sports industry policy. And November last year, we had a two day meeting, a technical committee, which involved the Ministry of Youth and Sports Development, and six other ministries, education, science and tech, industry, trade and investment, communications and digital economy, information and culture. And under these ministries, you know, you have agencies and parastatals. So we're drawing those linkages. In fact, the document we hope to deliver eventually will highlight and identify the responsibilities and areas in which each of these ministries, through their parastatals agencies, will be able to give support to realizing uh, a sports industry policy, particularly its implementation. So there are linkages. We're exploring those linkages. All right, then, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, let, let, on a final note, let's, let's look ahead. Um, Ijama asked you earlier on about uh, a 10-year development plan. At the end of those 10 years, if, for example, that plan was actually to see the light of day and was to be implemented faithfully, uh, where should we be, particularly in terms of the development of the youth? And I'll give you an example very briefly. There are those who talk about the fact that we talk about leaders of tomorrow, but that we're not preparing the leaders for tomorrow. So uh, in terms of that, where do you hope to see us at that point, 10 years from now, which will be 2030? Well, let me just also, let me mention, November last year, we did come up with a new program called DEAL. That's D-E-E-L. D, D for digital literacy and skills acquisition. E for entrepreneurship. The second E for employability. And the L for leadership and mentoring. Now, this, under this nomenclature, we've been able to develop a number of programs. Most of them existing before, but we have sharpened their focus and deepened the content. And we believe that if we follow through 
on these key areas. When you look at digital literacy and skills acquisition, that's the future and is now. You look at employability. What's the future of employability? You must have the relevant skills to get employed, but also you must be ready to come up with solutions to present day challenges. Then you look at entrepreneurship. No country in the world has been able to bring down the youth unemployment level without deliberately turning its youth into entrepreneurs. And we have started on that part with the 75 billion Naira uh, Youth Investment Fund and a couple of other programs by BOI, by the Central Bank, etc. We are on that part so that we can ratchet up the number. What do I hope to see in 10 years when it comes to youth development? I hope to see that most of our youth are no longer dependent on white collar job or civil service job. But rather, like we have in Germany, I saw the report that came earlier, like we have in China, our youth can have technical skills, can be problem solvers, can be entrepreneurs, can be wealth creators, can be employers of labor, and that the numbers can go up. In 10 years' time, I hope that the digital skills gap that we have in this country, and of course in Africa, can be sufficiently uh, filled to the level that we will have about 65% of our youth skilled in the present day skills that we need so that they can be competitive. Remember, they can work here and outsource their skills. You can work here through a remote with Wi-Fi. You can work for a company in the UK. You can telecommute as the case may be. I hope that we can have youth that will have the opportunities that is needed and the skills that is needed to compete. As All right, Honourable Minister. Thank you, Honourable Minister for Sports. You, Honorable Minister for sports. We, talk about, we talk about the three eyes. Okay. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a minute eyes. to round go it up. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to sports development, in 10 years, we talk about the three eyes that are critical. The first eye is infrastructure. There needs to be an infrastructural rationalization. Right now, we don't have the sporting infrastructure necessary and needed for us to be able to develop our sports. We hope we'll have the necessary infrastructure from the stadium, the equipment, etc. The second eye is investment. Beyond government funding, we need private investment all over the world. Without private investment, you cannot develop sports. The, the third eye is incentive. Government on its part must provide the necessary incentive that we attract investors, both local and foreign, to come into our sports sector and develop our sports and also invest in the talents of our youth. The last one is the P, which is the policy. And we hope that we can deliver a sports industry policy before the end of this year, 2020. All right, Honorable Minister for Sports and Youth Development, Sunday Dari, thanks a lot for joining us. Happy Independence Day to you as well. Quite interesting, the infrastructure investment incentive. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you very much.